This is Professor Eric Miller from the uh, University of Toronto Department of Civil Engineering. Discussion. I uh, just got the last few minutes of Jack's presentation. And uh, so what I'm, I'm going to be stepping back. I'm, I'm not going to be talking about hardcore engineering here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking about planning. I just did uh, and, uh, and about uh, what some of the elements I think that we have to be thinking about to get to a better transit system. Uh, background being, of course, uh, one of the decisions that have been made recently and uh, going here in terms of, in terms of transit things that haven't been happening years. And I, I guess to start, I, um, one thing I did hear Jack says, we've had too much planning. Um, and I hear that a lot. And, and uh, in some ways I agree, but I, I think uh, in some ways I would argue that we actually need better better planning, uh, perhaps somewhat different planning, but even more importantly to take planning seriously. And I think that's what I really need to say here. Is I think one of our huge problems that we've had locally here for a long, long time uh, is more often than not, we don't take planning seriously enough. We don't put, we haven't put enough resources into it. Uh, I, I think, I think there's more, much more we could have been doing mm -hmm. with planning to, to better inform what we're doing. I think Metrolinx in particular is doing a great job trying to raise the bar in terms of in terms of planning in, in this uh, in, in this region. But uh, but I, I think uh, you know, and we can talk about what the planning process involves. Uh, but. Uh, I mean, I think one of the things it involves is, is continuous feedback and continuous learning. And I think one problem that perhaps we've had in this region, and I'm not sure we've learned from our planning, we've been doing planning for a long time, but to a certain extent it's the same old, same old, same old all over again. Uh, and, and we don't see a lot of new ideas coming out necessarily over time. And I think I think taking a the planning process as a continuous one, where we should be continuously learning and improving our methods, improving our data, and so forth, is something that I think perhaps we could be doing, doing a better job on. But most importantly, why is it that we plan? We plan to inform decision making. Planning is not an end in itself. Yes, and so if all we ever do is plan and write nice reports, um, and I build computer models and you know, crank a bunch of numbers. If that's all we do, that is a waste of time. The reason we're supposed to be doing that is to inform, first of all, to inform and engage the public and decision makers in discussion and debate and to educate them. Um, about what, the, what the, the, the evidence is, the best facts, how things actually work, what, what works, what doesn't. So first of all, planning should be informing that process in a very effective way. Um, I'll just go back. Um, one of the things that planning should be doing, and, I, and this is where I don't think we have done a very good job, is we should be telling stories. We should be, we should be able to explain to the public why this works and why that doesn't, why this is a good idea, why, why that isn't, what the risks are of this approach, but what are the risks of doing nothing? And one thing I think we have a huge problem with in this region is we don't appreciate the risks of doing nothing. And to a certain extent, we've done nothing for 25 years in many respects, and we're paying for it now, we're going to continue to pay for it because people are inherently conservative, they don't like change, um, and so the easiest thing, and they don't like spending money, so the easiest thing is to do nothing. One of the things we've not done a good job of is showing people why that's a bad thing to do. So we, I, I think as a community, as a professional community, we have to do a much better job of explaining the benefits, the real benefits and costs, the real risks and rewards of different approaches. We do a better job of explaining what it is is possible to do, what maybe isn't quite so, so good to do. And we should be, be more, I think, more proactive in terms of recommending courses of action. We don't decide as planners, decision makers decide. And so, and so, so planning to be effective has to be informing that debate in a much more effective way than I think possibly we've managed in the past. The other thing we should be engaged in is with decision making implementation. We need to be giving decision makers the information they need in ways that they can understand it in the ways that are useful to us. And so, and so if planning is going to be effective, it's, it's got to be engaged with decision making. Now, the problem is, I think, too much in this region is those channels of information flow have broken down that we haven't we haven't done, as I said, done this good job of informing debate as perhaps we have. The, the discussion between between the public and, and the politicians is <coughs> odd at best here on the time. <laughs> <laughs> what's really missing, I think, is we've lost that connection. The decision makers don't care about planning. They don't listen to the planners. They disrespect planning. They don't take planning seriously. We've had we've had this we've had uh, planning by press conference here for the last 40 years, going back to McVeil Davis. Uh, and announced when he, when he killed the, the Spadina Expressway, and he also announced at the same time that it was going to be out of how many 
and you can probably say how many tens of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers of magnetic levitation, Go intermediate, intermediate capacity transit that we we're going to, within five or five, ten years, we're going to have this network of maglev vehicles running all over, all over the city uh, that's going to supply transit and make it not necessary to have any more, any more uh, uh, highways. Have you noticed any maglev vehicles running around town lately? <laughs> uh, it didn't happen. Uh, somebody whispered in his ear, said this was a good idea, you, need, you, you can't just kill the expressway, you've got to have an idea. So, you know, somebody <laughs> took out a crayon that's been used a lot since, <laughs> lines on maps, and he announced it. And, and then, uh, you know, planners were then told to go off and make this thing work. And since then, and, and, and since then we've had one, one study, a lot of planning that's gone on has been, has been to justify announcements in the press by politicians before the planning was done. So the car wreck problem is either the decision makers don't pay attention to planning, or they make the decision first, and then tell the planners to go off and justify it. And, and until we reverse that process and get back to uh, having proper technical input in decision making, we may be in trouble. Uh, so from that point of view, what I want to do is spend the rest of my few minutes here trying to talk a little bit of some of the things that I think are important to consider um, in, in trying to design a transit, uh, transit plan, a transit policy to actually get transit built that may do something for us. The first, uh, the first uh, step, I think, is to understand, in fact, who does use transit, who <coughs> might use transit, um, and what the demand for transit is and could be. Now, that sounds pretty motherhoodish, but you'd be surprised how little decision makers uh, and how little of the debate is actually informed what the actual travel patterns in this region are. Some of you may know I was involved in that, in that incredible uh, uh, experience of the Shepherd Avenue, uh, you know, LRT versus subway debate a year or so ago now. Um, and I was shocked that in that discussion, the entire discussion about those two technologies, first of all, they weren't even they're different technologies, different groups, they weren't even apples to apples. But there were about three numbers being used to compare the two, two alternatives. Peak point loading, uh, greenhouse gas savings, and average travel time savings, all of which were not terribly well defined. Um, there was very little information available, even though all the models and analysis that were done by the planners, there's gigabytes of data that could have been used to inform more richly the differences and the pros and cons of those two things we <coughs> weren't using. But over and above that, nobody knew where the people in Scarborough actually traveled to each day. And th so nobody knew what they needed in terms of transit. And I just went in, we, had, we have lots and lots of information. So I just went into our, our Transportation Tomorrow Survey database, and I just pulled out what the travel patterns for Scarborough were. And I, I dummied them up on a Google map and put it on a PowerPoint slide and took it to a meeting. And, and it turns out that two-thirds of the people in Scarborough, um, you know, travel within Scarborough. They never leave Scarborough. Most of the rest are either going downtown or they're going north or they're going east. So a subway connecting to the North York City Center was serving something like 2% of the, of the travel. So we're having this huge debate about <coughs> trying to improve transit in Scarborough, and we're talking about spending billions of dollars for something that would have you know, this much impact on the daily lives of most people in Scarborough. So surely it would be better if we understood, before we get into these heated debates, if we, if we actually understood what the problem was. You're almost all engineers here. You know, you, before you design the bridge, you have to figure out you know, you know, what's, what river is it that we're going to cross. And, and you know, and what's the volume flow, and you know, some some basic parameters of the problem before you rush off and start and start the <laughs> Second of all, obviously, we need to know what the tools are we can bring to, to bear. What are the technologies? What are the services? Uh, what's the performance of different kinds of transit, and what's it suitable to serve? And also, fundamentally, we have to understand that when we talk about transportation, we can't just talk about transportation. We understand that transportation serves the land use, it serves people. It's urban form that drives transportation as much as transportation drives urban form. And, and, and if we don't have a match between the urban form, the population, employment distributions, the densities, and so forth, and our transit system, our transportation system, it's not going to, not going to work. And again, that, that understanding is often very much lacking. So just to show some trends, I think people are very familiar with this, but why is transportation such a huge issue in this region? Well, again, if you look over the last 20 years, 25 years, um, we've built very little transportation in this region. Uh, very few roads, very little transit. At the same time, the population is growing immensely. 
depending on the measure and the boundaries, Toronto is one of the fastest, if not the fastest growing, particularly in a continuous sense, urban region in North America. Um, uh, it's arguable that no city, no, no urban region in, in, in North America, other than maybe Mexico City, uh, we always forget that they're part of North America too, um, has, has, has experienced the same sort of growth stresses. So we've grown tremendously, but we've added very little infrastructure. Um, households in auto ownership naturally have increased with population. Uh, but transit and, and, and non-motorized travel hasn't kept up because we haven't provided the, the infrastructure. So the growth and congestion we see out there is no surprise. The demand has gone up tremendously. The supply hasn't increased hardly at all. There's a mismatch. And, and, and because we haven't kept up with it over time, we're now in a, in a bit of a crisis situation. That population growth has gone on everywhere, and I apologize for all these numbers. Someday I'll get it into a proper chart. But the big thing to notice is there has been growth in the Toronto downtown, a lot of growth in the Toronto downtown, but huge growth out in the 905 in the suburban regions. And, and that's, that's the big challenge is that we've been growing in a very auto oriented environment that's, that traditionally is very difficult to serve by transit. And again, we're trying, we're trying to catch up with that. Uh, trip making has gone on in, in the same way, and again, we see huge growth, particularly in 905 regions, uh, commensurate with the population. Uh, and, the, uh, and the auto drive trips have gone up tremendously. The trip rates and the percentage of auto trips have gone up more than proportional to population. So again, it's no wonder that we experience congestion in this region. Transit ridership has increased, but not proportionally. Um, and and uh, over a long period of time, transit Transit ridership has gone up, transit home shares haven't gone up. Interestingly enough, between 2001 and 2006, we actually started to reverse that trend. Mode shares across the region actually went up between 2001 and 2006. I haven't had a chance to look at our most recent survey data from 2011-12 yet, it just came out. Uh, hopefully we'll see that trend continuing. And that's very interesting because despite a very minimal investment transit and go has go over that time period go and extend capacity a bit. Uh, Viva came online uh, in the early days in up in York. Uh, there has actually been a bit of expansion in, in transit in some of the Metro Five region. But I think it's also a question of congestion, catching up with things and people looking for alternatives. Uh, and just imagine what the transit ridership might have been if we'd actually been giving them real supply increases, real improvements in service over that time period. Um, and, and uh, th this trend, if we break it down across the region, we see the Toronto downtown is the only place where auto, ownership, auto, auto usage has, has gone down over time. Everywhere else it's gone up. And, and similarly, transit home shares kind of go the other way. So when we can dig into this much, much more deeply uh, to look at the trends, the, the old origin destination patterns, where are the main travel markets? And if we did that, maybe we'd have a better understanding of where we should be putting our emphasis it's not that we don't do that in some of our planning work, but I think there's much more we can be doing. And again, particularly much more in communicating to decision makers, to the public at large, what that travel pattern looks like and where the stresses in the system really are. Okay, so moving to transit. Uh, you know, what are the factors that affect transit usage? <coughs> we want to shift people from the car to transit. Uh, what are the factors that influence their decision about whether to take transit or not? And these are all pretty straightforward, pretty probably all familiar with them, you know, it's, it has to do with travel times and costs, but also reliability. At times, there are different types of times. There's the time we actually spend in the vehicle, there's the time we spend walking to and from the vehicles, there's the wait and transfer times. Each of those are important, but if you actually look at the behavior, and if you actually look at what influences people's behavior, the walk and the wait times are disproportionately weighted relative to uh, in-vehicle time. Uh, a minute spent walking or waiting is, is weighted psychologically in terms of people's decision making at least two to three times more heavily than a minute on a bus or on the vehicle. That makes sense. Once you're on the vehicle, you're out of the cold, maybe you're sitting down, you're reading paper, uh, listening to your iPod, whatever, uh, as opposed to standing, standing out in the cold and rain hoping that maybe a bus eventually shows up or slogging through the snow walking, walking there. So if, if we look at transit services and how to improve services and how to attract people, Reducing walk and wait time, uh, access egress times, reducing wait times are very important. But the other thing that's very, very important is, is reliability. Um, and one of the biggest obstacles to get somebody to take transit relative to 